All right, hello. I was gonna say I was gonna say nice to see you, but uh, that wouldn't that wouldn't make sense. Nice to be seen by you. Um, nice to be seen by you sounds arrogant. So let's just say hello. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Uh, hope you can celebrate well today. Even though it's obviously a unique Mother's Day, I would probably guess that that's a unique Mother's Day for all mothers out there. Uh, but regardless, I hope you can spend the day if you are a mom being celebrated, eating good food, drinking good drinks, doing the things that, that bring you joy. Uh, I hope that's uh, the case for you today at our house. Emma's gonna be out at a garden center uh, picking out flowers and plants. She loves to do that. She's gonna take advantage of garden centers uh, reopening this weekend to, uh, to walk through and then I'm gonna try to make scones uh, at home. So hopefully both those things go well and then we've got we've got actually got a toddler's birthday on monday so we're doing mom on sunday toddler on monday and i just took a glance through the calendar in the year 2025 we're going to have the intersection of mother's day and chester's birthday so i'm not sure what we're going to do we're prepare i'm preparing now for that for 2025 but we're going to take a, a break from our series through first samuel this morning and do a little talk on mother's day and uh, then you can do whatever you need to do to be celebrated or to celebrate the mom or the moms in your life. And here's the big point I'm going to make this morning. Uh, probably not earth shattering, but it's, it's simply this. We have life because of our mothers. We have life because of mothers, right? Moms are indispensable to life. And, and I know that I wasn't uh, aware of that or recognizing that fact for most of the time that I was in my mom's house, that I was living with my parents. Uh, but that doesn't change the fact that moms are indispensable to life. Even when we're not recognizing it, even when we're ignoring it, moms are indispensable to life. And not just because of the biological reason, not just because moms give birth to us, but also because we're helpless for so long. So many years of our life are sustained because of the care and the sacrifice of of mothers, people that are able to take care of our needs. Um, this week in our little book group that we're, uh, our little discussion group that we have on Thursday evenings, we were talking a little bit about Jesus' humanity. And in Christ, we see the divine and the human held together, coming together, right? But part of Jesus' humanness implies that for the first years of his life, Jesus relied primarily on his parents. Uh, perhaps largely he depended on his mother, on Mary, to be protected, to be cared for, to be fed, to be clothed, and so on. We don't often think about that. It's kind of a strange thought, but, but Jesus would have gone through the stages of childhood, right? He would have gone through the stages of life, whatever those looked like for a Mediterranean peasant in the ancient world. Uh, he had to go through those stages. And that is a strange thought because, it, but it has a, uh, an implication. And the implication is this, that, that Christianity is not a, a sterilized faith. It's not a faith that we live out just in our minds, in, in concepts and ideas and beliefs and doctrines. It's a faith that's really lived in. It's a faith that's lived out. Again, Christian theology or doctrine or our beliefs aren't supposed to be just intellectual. I believe they're supposed to be lived out or lived in. And I think one of the places that that's evident in the Bible is in Jesus' birth story. So we're going to look at Luke's gospel, the start of Luke's gospel, which is the only gospel that contains a birth story. And we're probably most familiar with it around Christmas time and children's plays and things like that. But we're going to look at a few passages of it this morning. So we'll start in verse 26 of Luke chapter 1. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So Gabriel shows up a couple times in the Bible, once in the book of Daniel, and then once here. And his name means man of God or warrior of God. So Gabriel shows up to the city of Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. 
It's funny to think that she's troubled. She's greatly troubled because it sounds like a pretty nice greeting, right? Oh, favored one. Uh, but anyway, so at verse 30, it says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is the great theme of the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, and that's the reign and the rule of God and the, the coming of God's kingdom in, in a greater way and in a fuller way. And of course, it's a kingdom that's not limited by geography or by politics or by ethnic background or by gender or by social class or anything else. It's a different kind of a kingdom. And yet when that kingdom comes, it upsets the kingdoms of this world, the political structures and the power structures of this world. But Mary, in response to what Gabriel says, asks a pretty good question. Here's Mary's question. She goes, Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. There's a hinting here already to the theme that we're talking about, that about life and specifically that God is about life. Here's Elizabeth, who's Mary's cousin, who Gabriel has said can't have kids, who is barren. And yet Elizabeth will soon um, be pregnant with, with John the Baptist. Or is already uh, pregnant with John the Baptist. Why? Because God makes the impossible possible. And God's going to make life possible in this impossible kind of way inside Mary as well. And I love these next few verses because of the sense of anticipation. And I think it's the kind of anticipation that we still feel today when a new baby is about to be born. There's a new baby that's going to be born in my house uh, towards the end of this month. Uh, but there's something in us that gets excited for new life. So here's the little scene. It says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So the baby that Elizabeth is carrying hears Mary's voice and leaps in her womb. And whatever, whatever that means, I think what it's saying is that the, John the Baptist, who's in Elizabeth, is pretty excited about this, right? Why? Because life is exciting. New life is exciting. And this is the Jesus who's going to be called the author and the perfecter of life. It's an exciting thing, right? It's real. That's the thing about life. Life is real. And we take it for granted a lot of the times. But then there are also moments or there are also times when we can recognize how real life is, how amazing life is. And verse 43 says, And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to me, my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And then in response, Mary offers the Magnifica. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done a great things for me. And holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and has exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. 
and as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So why is Mary so excited? This incredible, worshipful prayer she offers. And why? Because the, I would say, suggest the simplest answer is that she trusts in, she believes in, she leans on the goodness of God. Again, she says things like, He who is mighty has done great things for me, or His mercy is for those who fear Him, or He has shown strength with His arm, or He has filled the hungry with good things, or He has helped His servant Israel. These are speaking to or reflecting the goodness of God. And I guess what's really being reflected here is Mary's trust in the goodness of God. And she's recognizing, I think, that the life that's uh, inside her is a result of the goodness of God. What God has blessed her with or what's happening with her in her uh, is a, a, a result of the goodness of God. So we'll read a couple of passages from Luke chapter 2. Uh, start with verse 4. It says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house uh, and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there was shepherd out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Here's the great news. It's a baby, right? It's a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths lying with his mom. This is the scene that, that demonstrates the intersection of divinity and humanity. And motherhood is an indispensable part of that picture. Skipping down to, to verse 40, it says, And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Jesus grew. Jesus grew. He went through the normal stages of human development and, uh, and childhood, and, and we don't see that happening, but it's in the backdrop of the Gospels. Luke offers that one little scene where Jesus is at the temple. Uh, they go to Jerusalem. Jesus is at the temple as a kind of young kid or young teenager arguing with the, the temple priests and so on. But when we meet Jesus as a 30-year-old and he begins his ministry, he's already gone through these life stages. And his mother, his parents, would have been part of his learning and his growth and his protection and so on. And so, well, Jesus is the focus of the Gospels. We can't talk about Jesus' birth story without talking about his mother, right? And that's because Jesus' mother bore the responsibility of caring for him of feeding him, of raising him, which means that family is part of the Jesus story, which means family is part of the Christian story. And my understanding of Mother's Day is that it's a day to celebrate mothers, and we celebrate them for the blessing that they are, we celebrate them for the sacrifices that they have made, and the blessing that they provide and the sacrifices they they make are so that their families can grow and that their families can flourish. Or to put it in another way, we recognize mothers for their blessing and their sacrifice so that their families can experience life, so they can see life in their families. And I think that reflects something of the nature of God, something about who God is. I think God is about life. We saw it in this uh, story before that God brings life to Elizabeth. God brings life to Mary. I think the kingdom of God is about life. So often when Jesus is talking about the kingdom, he's talking about plants and fruitfulness and harvests and so on. And in John's gospel, Jesus offers this, this little statement that I just love. He says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 
that God is about life. And I think mothers are about life. And not just that, but abundant life, the flourishing of life. And I think abundant life doesn't just mean happiness or it doesn't just mean success all the time because sometimes life can come through suffering, right? Sometimes a grain of wheat needs to fall to the ground and break open so that something new can grow up. But abundant life or the flourishing of life, I think, means creating and sustaining and amplifying things that are really worthwhile, things that are beautiful. Biological life is part of that, to be sure, but also fostering and, and uh, helping human connections and relational connections to flourish, helping creativity to flourish, helping art or business or, or anything that's worthwhile to flourish. And just like Mary is part of the story of Jesus and the life of Jesus, mothers, I think, are always part of the story of life. And mothers will always be part of the story of life. Part of creating life, sustaining life, enhancing life has to involve mothers. And let's be honest, sometimes we forget that, right? Sometimes uh, that's not at the top of our mind, right? Perhaps especially when we're young, but I think we can just take life for granted and therefore we can take mothers for granted for much of the time that we are alive, much of, of the time that we're living out our lives. Just watching my kids, especially the older two, relate to Emma, their mom, they're not always grateful. <laughs> they're not always filled with awe and wonder about this person who is sacrificing for them so that they can flourish, who is, is helping them to grow and succeed and do well in their lives. In fact, they're almost never aware of it. They're almost never aware of Emma's investment in them. But here's the thing. Even when it's unrecognized, mothers are part of the story of life. And on Mother's Day, we have this, this opportunity where, as a society, we all kind of pause. And we all have the opportunity to give recognition and give thanks to mothers, not just for what they give up, but for what they bless us with, which at its most basic is simply life. So thank you to mothers. Thank you uh, to all mothers at whatever level, from biological to spiritual or whatever. I think that that mothering impulse or mothering instinct reflects something of the nature of God, reflects something of the goodness of God. And so we want to give thanks to God today, to be sure, but we want to give thanks to you as well for the incredible blessing that you are, the incredible uh, sacrifices that you make. And so let's pray. God, we thank you today for mothers. We thank you for, uh, for those people that are just involved inextricably in life, in all of our lives, but in the bringing of life, in the flourishing of life. We thank you, Lord, that we, we have life, we have existence, and because of that, we can fill our lungs with thanksgiving and with praise. We want to worship you, Lord, and we want to worship you for your goodness, just as Mary leaned into and trusted your goodness. And part of your goodness, Lord, I just believe is reflected in mothers being mothers. And so help us today, Lord, to celebrate mothers well, to recognize mothers well, to honor mothers well. We thank you, Lord, that something of your heart is reflected in this day. We want to do you well, Lord. We want to honor you in the name of Jesus and in his name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, we will see you soon. Bye-bye.